how many times do we have to forget until we stop forgetting and start remembering? That's called change. How many times do we have to go unconscious to the point where we no longer go unconscious and we stay conscious. That's the moment of change. Now, if you're truly out of the bleachers and you're on the playing field, and this happens to a lot of people in our work, they say, you know, I really believe that this is the truth. I really believe that you mm -hmm. could heal yourself. I really believe you could change your life. I've seen the testimonials. I just never believed that it could happen to me. Now, this is a big moment. Now you're really stepping on the playing mm -hmm. field. So. A person who starts doing their work, they're not, they're not interested in healing. The, true, the tr person who's truly interested in this work, they understand that the only way they can heal is that they have to change. They're not saying, I'm gonna wait for my wealth or my healing to happen in order for me to feel grateful and be joyful in life. They're saying, if I feel grateful, my healing's gonna begin, right? If I, if I feel more whole, then there should be some change in my gene expression. So they've studied the content, they've studied the information, and now it becomes extremely practical. So they may have a great meditation, and we've seen this happen to many people. They sleep better, they have less pain, they have more energy, but their blood values never change. Now they don't say, oh, I feel better, but I'm failing, this doesn't work. They say, what is it about me that's stopping this from completely healing? Okay, how am I mm -hmm. <laughs> in my waking day? Oh. The moment you begin to ask that question, you turn on the frontal lobe and the frontal lobe is the seat of your conscience. Now the moment you start looking at, at the end of your day, how did I do? This is such an important question. How did I do today? Mm. Did I fall from grace? When did I lose it? And who did I lose it with? If I had another opportunity, how would I do it differently? They'll tell you, I've, I've seen them stand on the stage and tell their story and say, I had to start really watching myself in my life. Yeah. How I was emotionally responding to my ex, how I was emotionally responding to my financial problems. I had to really, really pay attention to that. And that takes an enormous amount of energy and an enormous amount of awareness yeah. to stop the program, right? So you forget and you go, damn, I went unconscious there. Now you didn't lose, you didn't fail. You just became conscious. Now, if you keep becoming so conscious of your unconscious states, you're, you're outside the program. You're only in the program when you're unconscious. Yeah. The moment you're conscious, you can objectify your subjective self. So you can see yourself through the eyes of someone else. So the learning process comes from the mistake. The yeah. brain learns by mistakes and surprises. I, I've made enough of them in my life. It's just whether you're gonna do it again. Yeah. You wanna do it again, you're back in the habit, back in the routine. If you say, this is it. The next time that happens, I am not gonna do that. Not for anybody else, but because those emotions actually, my response to that person or that circumstance is actually weakening the organism. Yeah. Is that person, that circumstance worth it? So then it's evolution, it's evolution. The challenge then has to be met with a greater level of mind. Now, if you're just doing your meditation, just because you wanna please God or do the right thing or feel good about yourself, that's gonna get stale after a while because it's just gonna become another routine between your coffee and your shower and your emails and your drive to work and people aren't present, mm. right? So, so <laughs> the familiar past conditioning is based on the past, that thought and the feeling, but habituation is the programming them to predictable future, that's the known. So if you teach a person how to find the present moment, that's where the unknown exists and that takes, that takes a lot of energy and a lot of awareness. And yet, if you practice it, the body literally will begin to respond to the mind. It's like training an animal, it finally relaxes. And when that occurs, your response to people and circumstances in your life will be different because you overcame yourself at the beginning of the day. So I'm an early morning guy, just like you. I get up really early, why? Because nobody bothers me. What time? 4.30ish, somewhere around there. And, what, and then what do you do? Um, I get in my think box. What's a think box? Well, okay, what am I doing today? But I'm not gonna sit down and just jump into a meditation. What thoughts, before I go into this meditation, am I gonna stay away from? Well, what circumstances, what things I can think about later that aren't that important to me? What emotions, what memories am I gonna stay away from? If I go there, I know what that's gonna do. I mean, why am I doing this meditation? What am I gonna be doing? What am I, well, how am I gonna do it? So I, just like, just like 
any, anybody who does anything really well. You get in your think box and you organize what you're going to do. Are you doing this in bed or are you having coffee first? Or? I just get up, move around a little bit, you know, do a few things, maybe write some notes down because then I can assign meaning to the act. I can stay conscious when I'm in it. So you do all this before your meditation. Okay. Always. But then when I get in my play box, there's no thinking. I did all my thinking in my think box. You did all your thinking in your think box. Is that also when sometimes we wake up and there's these kind of thoughts that are just popping up? Is, is you writing down a few things? Is you processing them a way of sort of quietening down the noise so right, that you so, can so, drop into yeah, meditation? Yeah, so let's say I have 10 Zoom meetings <laughs> in okay. one day. I look at my calendar and I go, okay, none of that. Really, I'm going to get to all of that. This is not my time to think about the known. I know all this stuff is going to work out. I know how the Zoom meetings are going to go. <laughs> okay, but let me just make sure when I'm in these certain Zoom meetings that I'm leading with my heart and I'm being the person that I want to be as an example for my team. I want to make sure I'm communicating really clearly. I'll make time for this, that. Okay, I get all that out of the way. Well, that's all the known stuff. But when I come to execute now, well, what am I going to do to open my heart today? Like, what am I really going to do? How, when I do the breath to bring energy into my brain, what am I bringing? Like, where am I going to go to that? What, what do I want to experience? What, what, how do I do that? Let me just review that. Okay, then I'm going to open my focus. I'm going to go deep into nothing. I'm going to go as far as I can. And then when I get to that point, then I'm going to create. And when I create, this is what I'm going to create. So I'm not thinking in when I'm there, what should I create? I've already got that all worked out. I'm rehearsing. I'm getting clear on what I'm going to do. I'm getting clear on what I'm not going to do. I'm getting clear on how my last meditation was and how I want to evolve my next meditation. That. So then when I get to my play box... I'm not analyzing and thinking because if I'm analyzing and thinking, I can't do it, right? So I get that worked out. If it takes me half an hour, I allow for two hours for myself. If it takes me half an hour to get very clear, and sometimes there's disturbing things that I have to get through because there's meetings and stuff like that. And, but I just go, that is all always going to work out. This is you, this is your time. It's, it's interesting, Dr. Joe, that for many of us, for many people, meditation is almost like your pre-day ritual, Right, so you, you meditate to prime yourself for your day, how you're going to be. But when you talk about your morning routine, you have a pre-meditation ritual, yeah. which, I th which I find really, really interesting. Because I, I want to get into it. I want to like, assign meaning yeah. to what I'm doing. When you assign meaning to the act, you turn on your prefrontal cortex. And the prefrontal cortex says, quiet. Everybody that's not involved in this intention, settle down. So the frontal lobe will actually lower the volumes of the circuits in the brain that, that, that are disturbing. So, so when you assign meaning to something, you get more value from it. So I just learned that if I just get in and just do my meditation, sometimes they're wonderful because I've done it enough times. But if I just drop in, it just it, it doesn't have any meaning. If it doesn't have any meaning, then it just becomes another routine. You're you're doing your meditation, but you're thinking about your coffee. You're doing drinking your coffee. You're already thinking about yeah. your emails. Your the brain's an anticipation machine, and we lose our free will to that kind of programming. So, so after I when I get my think box really clear, it's just like when I used to golf. I would just kind of look at where I was going to hit the ball. I was thinking about the the club I was going to use, how I was going to swing, how I was going to feel. I work it all out in my think box. When I get my play box, I've done all my thinking. Now I'm just going to yeah. execute, right? So, so we found that when people do that, we do this in our week-long events. I'll always say to the audience, all right, after we come back from the break, uh, so turn to someone now and I want you to have a conversation about what you love about yourself, yeah. that you did really well in that last meditation. What did you stick what, what felt right for you? What did you execute really well? I want you to articulate that and remind yourself, reproduce that same level of mind, install the neurological hardware by yeah. firing and wiring so you can step into that footprint and do that again in the next meditation. Then I say to them, now let's light a match in a dark place. If you had another opportunity to do another meditation, what would you bring? What would you work on improving? What would you become aware that you don't want to do, that you did in that last meditation. Mm -hmm. Let's get really clear about what you're not going to do. And if you had another opportunity, what you would do. And somehow that kind of shapes the brain for the next experience for them to evolve their experience because they're in the experience. Now they're, they're like, oh yeah, I'm not going down the, I'm not getting off the exit of my job. I'm not getting off the exit of yeah. my ex. I'm going to go straight. I'm going to just keep, you can make those turns in the beginning. It's normal. But you start making those turns and then all of a sudden you're realizing, I'm not going to make those turns and you drive right past the exit. I drive right past, I'm too old. 
Yeah. I drive right past them too out of shape. I drive right past them. I'm the night disease and can go away. Yeah. Um, there's something wrong with me. You just keep driving past those and the next thing you know, you run into something big. So it's trial and error, you know? I mean, this is like, it's so important for people to realize if it took them, if it took them two years to, of, of chronic stress to develop their health condition, it's not going to go away into meditations. You know, when I tell them, I say, you're not that good. You're just not that yeah. good. Like, just get real here. Like, one foot in the quantum world, one foot in the real world. This, I'm a pragmatist. I don't want to talk about quantum superimposition if it has no value in my life. I want to talk about what it is that, that evolves my experiences. So if you're truly in the game of change, yeah. then you would be rehearsing how you were going to be in the next Zoom meeting if you were really off in the last one. If you wouldn't, you wouldn't say, oh, I'm this way because of that person or that circumstance. That's that program of being a victim saying that person or that circumstance is actually controlling the way I feel and think. My response to that person is making me sick. It's actually yeah. weakening the organism. Okay, well, the next time I have that opportunity, if I'm truly in the game of evolution, let's see if I can stay in my heart and the whole time I'm not gonna react. That would be a victory for me. That would be a victory. So then when at the end of your day, you go, I actually kind of love myself. I actually got my behaviors to match my intentions. I got my actions equal to my thoughts. I had a new experience in it. Yeah. It actually felt good. Hey, I'm gonna do that again. And you start doing it with your children. You start doing it, uh, opening the door for the person who's walking out of the, 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 the office yeah. building. You start letting people go ahead of you in traffic. You're, you're just cool. You're no longer in that vigilant state. Now, get enough people doing that. And we, all of a sudden you start noticing your wife a little bit differently or Rungan's all of a sudden starting to smile a little bit more. He seems way more relaxed and chilled. People are going to start getting relaxed and chilled around you because mirror neurons in the tribe say, hey, there's somebody doing something that I'd like to do. I just need evidence to be able to do it. And all of a sudden you start developing a community of people yeah. that start behaving differently. What's the significance of that? That's called emergence. An emergent consciousness is that everybody's behaving differently. And that is what's going to change the world, you know? Knowledge is the forerunner to experience. The more people understand what they're doing and why they're doing it, the how gets easier. And this is a time in history where it's not enough to know. This is a time in history to know how. Mm -hmm. The practical application in understanding that philosophy, that theory, that intellectual knowledge, that information, once you start to apply it and personalize it and demonstrate it, the more you can understand that, why you're doing it and what you're doing it, you get greater value out of it. So we have people that are diagnosed with serious health conditions that are nurses, that are cancer researchers, that are physicians, that are engineers, or, or just a person who just really wants to understand the content. Now this is it's so much easier to forget this information than to remember yeah. it. It's just, I, I, I always laugh at myself because I have to go back and relearn it again. And I think I know it pretty well and yet I forget. I don't mm -hmm. know why, but it's just the way it is. So. So when our meditations get stale, it's because we forget what we're doing, right? So the person who really, really takes the time to study instead of watching Netflix, instead of scrolling through TikTok, instead of getting on their phone and doing mindless texts or whatever, they're going to set aside an hour a day and I'm going to learn this information. When they sit down to do the work, they're present. Yeah. They're, they're, they understand if they feel this emotion that they're going to signal a new gene in a new way. If they feel the other emotion, they're going to down-regulate that gene and up-regulate the gene for their disease. So now it's, a, it's, a, it's an understanding. Yeah. If I rehearse how I'm going to be mentally, I'm going to install the hardware in my brain. If I keep doing it, it's going to become a software program. I'm going to start acting that way. Okay, if I say I can't, it's too hard, I'm too tired, I don't feel good, those are the things that stop me. Mm -hmm. Okay, but what if I just start saying anything is possible? I believe in synchronicities. What if I, with my intention and attention, just really get clear on that? Would that be the new, new voice in my head? So now... The person who's truly present and not thinking about their shower or the emails they have to do or their cell phone or their texts or when they have to take their kids to ballet or whatever, you're going to get to all of that. The person who's truly present, if they follow the instructions, we've seen them have very significant changes first in their subjective experience of themselves. Mm. Like, huh, wow, my back pain isn't fair. That's kind of weird. Or, God, I slept better last night. These small indicators are feedback to tell you that whatever you're doing inside of you is producing a result outside mm -hmm. of you. Keep that up over a period of time 
and you see instrumental changes taking place in the person. Now, another person who has had a series of traumas, been uh, abused in some way from, from childhood, uh, is facing a lot of health conditions, a lot of emotional and psychological conditions. We don't want them to heal in one week. We want them to work on overcoming those emotional states mm. and those are the victories. So sitting down in the meditation and when their body starts getting agitated or starts getting anxious, instead of quitting and saying, I can't meditate, because that would be the extent mm. of that person, just be curious. What's on the other side of this? Can I, can I lower the volume to this emotion? My body's craving this emotion. Let me settle it down into the present moment. That would be a victory. So that person with a lot of trauma, there's a moment in the meditation where they feel uncomfortable. The easy thing would be, hey, I'm gonna stop. I'm gonna put on Instagram. I'm gonna get a coffee. I'm gonna do anything else to distract me. Right, right, You're right. saying that's the key moment. You wanna sit with that and hopefully break through that. What I'm saying is there's no such thing as a bad meditation. There's only you overcoming you. People think I'm doing my meditation wrong. No, you're doing it right. Even if it's difficult. That is the moment that is going to define the person. So, so then the person goes, oh God, I feel really uncomfortable. I, I'm not a good meditator or something wrong with me. It's my trauma, it's my past, it's my parents, it's whatever. The person who says, no. No, I'm gonna sit in the presence of this anxiety and I'm gonna keep working with my body and I'm gonna keep lowering the volume to that emotion. Now listen, you keep lowering the volume to yeah. that emotion, you're gonna take your attention off that past problem because you only put your attention on that past problem because of the emotion. I'll never tell anybody to go back and review their past. I'll say overcome the emotion, overcome the emotion. This is a key point, I think, which I really want us to talk to you about today, Dr. Joe. Trauma, right? There's a lot of awareness growing now about trauma, the impact of our childhoods, how we're spoken to, the beliefs we take on as kids, how that impacts us as adults. Now, one approach to deal with trauma is to go there, to go and unpick it and uncover it and see a therapist and detail what happened, why it happened, you know, get an understanding of why you're behaving a certain way as an adult. Now, I think for many people, I include myself in this, that can be incredibly powerful and incredibly important. But I also see when I think of your work, I wouldn't say it's mutually exclusive necessarily from the outside at least, but is there a danger that we can spend too long in our trauma, processing our trauma, trying to think about it? Because effectively, a key message from your work is don't get stuck in those emotions of the past. Don't let your past define you. Think about that vision of the future. Start to feel what you want to feel in the future so you can experience it right now. But can someone go back, revisit their trauma, try and process it? Mm -hmm. And is that approach consistent with yours? Or would you say it's a better approach or a different approach is to not spend time there, just creates the new reality. Yeah, I think I'm, I, I'm down the middle on this, okay? I, I, I think there are many modalities that work for trauma. What I've discovered is that insight never really changes behavior. You can see that your father was overbearing or was an alcoholic, or you could see all these different things, you know, uh, like you could come up with the insight all these different things. The problem that I see with people is then they tend to excuse their change by saying, oh, I had a rough childhood. That's why I am the way I am. They are excusing their pre present position. So, and again, trauma is a difficult thing, but for me, <laughs> the person who's living by the identity in their life that they were traumatized as a child or whatever it is, or they've had a trauma in their life, I'm not saying forget the trauma and create another emotion. I'm saying that the person who's willing to go through the emotion and keep working on lowering the volume to it, the, the, we have had so many people in this work with brutal pasts, really, really difficult pasts, do the work and finally they reach that point where they just break free from the emotion. They look back and I have interviewed enough of them. 
It's the same thing. They look back at their entire past and they don't want to change one thing in their past because it brought them to this elegant moment where they're liberated. They see their betrayers, they see their abusers, they have nothing but love for them. Now the side effect of that, and many times they'll say, it was like my heart blew wide open. They had to pass through the valley of the shadow of darkness to get there. And they just thought, I, I don't know if I can go any further. And they went one more time. And the body literally was liberated from the past, right? Because the trauma is not just in the brain. The trauma is stored emotionally in the body. So you want to take the body out of the past, out of the known. What do you think the body's going to say if it's been conditioned to be the mind? The unknown is a scary place. You step out into the unknown, you're going to be unprepared for that trauma. You don't know how it's going to happen. And so the person keeps clinging to the known. And, but when the person finally overcomes the emotion... The body literally is freed from the chains of the past. The side effect of that is seeing the past from a greater level of consciousness. Lo and behold, there goes the suicidal tendencies, there goes the dysfunction, there goes the irritable bowel syndrome. That was because the body was still living in that past event by living by the same emotion. So the research on memory is kind of fascinating and I just, I've studied it enough and, and, and it, it the way we recount the past is not the way it happened, even if you absolutely think you remember it being that way. So we don't have the same brain as we did when we were eight years old or 12 years old or 20 years old. We have a different brain. We have a completely different brain. So the fabrication of the story for many people, they embellish the story and make it seem even worse than what it was. But you're really what you're saying is I changed in those moments and from a biological standpoint, I haven't been able to change since. So let me tell you why it's been so hard for me to change. And the story becomes dramatized or embellished. A person works them up, fire themselves into this emotional froth and then fires and wires the same circuits in the brain and they're actually reaffirming their limitation. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. I think we're just, we're just taking too long, right? So... 50% of that story isn't even the truth. It means, in a sense, we're reliving a miserable life that we never even had. And we don't want, but, but, the, but the, the unknown, people would rather cling to their suffering. None, none, this is not a judgment. We all do this. We'd rather stay in the known than take a chance in the unknown because those emotions of survival are saying what? run from the unknown. The unknown is a scary place. So now the unknown, you got to come up against that moment where you're going to actually leave that behind and step into the unknown. This is not a intellectual process. This is, this is David and Goliath. There's a battle going on where the body keeps wanting to go back to its familiar state because it's subconsciously been conditioned to be the mind, stay in the known. So then if the person keeps revisiting the trauma from the past, I'm not certain enough that when they revisit the trauma from the past, unless they learn how to desensitize their emotional response to it, that it's going to work for them. What I learned is that if the person overcomes the emotion, the memory without the emotional charge is called wisdom. And now you no longer belong to the past. So the body gets frustrated in the meditation. Instead of taking your uh, blindfolds off or turning the lights on and say, I listen to the voice, I can't meditate, there's too much. The sincere person says, what's on the other side if I can't? What's on the other side of this emotion? Let me see if I can settle my body back down out of that emotion and recondition it to a new mind. And the act of doing that in the beginning is very tedious. And all of a sudden, the person starts getting better at it. And they're telling their body it's no longer the mind, that they're the mind. They're executing a will that's greater than that program. And just like training an animal, you stay, you're not going to die, I'm going to feed you, you can check your emails, you can check your text, but this is my time right now. And you keep doing that with the body, keep settling it down to the present moment. It acquiesces, it surrenders to a new mind. And when that happens, we've seen this, we've measured it, there's a liberation of energy. We go from particle to wave, we go from matter to energy. That emotion is liberated from the body and now, now there's energy to heal. <laughs> there's energy to create a new life. It's, it's, it's available energy. It's free energy. Yeah. So the person goes, wow, I, I see it from a different level of consciousness. I have nothing but love. Or 
my goodness, I, I, I'm no longer that person. Uh, and, and they're now free from the past. Now, the side effect of that is that there's a biological upgrade. There's a neurological upgrade. There's a chemical upgrade. There's a genetic modification that's taking place. Why? You think the same way, you make the same choices, you do the same things, you create the same experiences, you feel the same emotions. Your biology will stay the same because you're the same. <laughs> now the person's thinking differently, they're making different choices, they're doing different things, or behaving in different ways, they're having new experiences, and they're certainly feeling different emotions the body reorganizes to a yeah. new chemistry. And, and, and they'll tell you, I'm not that person any longer. I'm literally not that person. And, and they're betrayers, even if they're family members, they have forgiveness for them. And what is forgiveness? You take your attention off the emotion. You overcome the emotion. You don't pay attention to the person or the problem. Now you're free. You free yourself and you free them. And 